Welcome everyone to, I'm Tiffany Farrell, the president of Southern Maryland Audubon Society. Thank you for joining our Audubon chapter for the monthly program, Birds and Cold Weather Adaptation. Most bird species enjoy warmer climes, but many have adapted to frigid conditions. How and why has this occurred? To answer this question, with an emphasis on Himalayan birds, we are extremely lucky to have as our speaker tonight, Dr. Sahas Barbe. Sahas grew up and went to college in the bustling low elevation city of Mumbai, India. After staring at the Himalayas from his hostel room for two years during his master's degree at the Wildlife Institute of India, he went on to work on Himalayan birds during his PhD at Cornell University. Sahas is currently a Peter Buck Fellow at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History and continues to study high elevation avifauna. Welcome, Dr. Barbe. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, thank you all for uh, having me and uh, hope you're doing well and uh, enjoying this cold weather, finally, that we have. So should I just begin, Stephanie, do you have? Um, okay. You can take it away, thank you. Great, let me share my screen and here we go. So, uh, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen uh, and today I'm gonna to basically talk about how birds stay warm or basically how birds deal with really uh, intense weather events and climate conditions and environmental conditions in general. And so my talk can be summarized as small birds on big mountains in thin air and cold weather. Before I begin uh, and tell you a little uh, more about Himalayan birds, by the way, thank you, Tiffany, for pronouncing the word Himalayas right. The word Himalay is a, is a Sanskrit word, which means the abode of snow. Him means snow and Ale is the house. So it's the house of snow. Uh, and it's the Himalayas and not the Himalayas. So before I talk about Himalayan birds, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So like Tiffany said, I grew up in uh, a, a city of 20 million people uh, in Mumbai, but I often took the early morning uh, train or bus out of the city on weekends to go bird in the wonderful mangrove habitats and forest habitats around Mumbai. So I uh, grew up birding in and around Mumbai and it, Mumbai is actually a really great place to grow up because uh, near and around and actually in Mumbai also, there are hundreds of bird species. So I, I gleaned this off of eBird uh, today and there are I think 330 species that have been reported so far from the city of Mumbai. So for a uh, city of 20 million people, that's pretty good number of uh, birds. So by the time uh, I had, done my master's at the Wildlife Institute of India. Uh, and by the time I came to the United States for my PhD, I had uh, the great fortune of working in a number of wonderful habitats all across the Indian subcontinent. And so that included working on foxes in the desert Northwest, um, rhinos and elephants in the floodplains of the river Brahmaputra in the Northeast of the country. Uh, I led a project on king cobras and I tracked them using little radio tags. Uh, and finally, just before I came to the States, I worked uh, on, on my first project of mo on mountain birds uh, in the south of the country, where we have sky islands, just like uh, we do here in, uh, in Southwest, the U Southwest United States. So there are sky islands and sky island endemic birds that we studied, um, and then I came to the States. So for, for my PhD, I studied how and why Himalayan birds are found at the elevation they did, that they do. And I continue to do that here at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where I leverage the, the large collection of specimens from the Himalayas uh, to understand more about Himalayan bird biology. So I don't have to tell you this, but the Himalaya, Himalayas are the biggest, highest mountains in the world. Uh, they, are found, they, are, they go all the way across the northern edge of the country and they form the boundary uh, between, between India and China uh, and India uh, and Bhutan. 
the Himalayas were created because of a really amazing uh, geological event. So India was all the way down in the Southern hemisphere about six, 70 million years ago. And it was uh, stuck with the Southern tip of Africa and, and Madagascar in this one giant landmass. And then it broke free from, from, from Africa first and then later from Madagascar. And we actually still have lizards, uh, skink species that, are, that share close ancestry with other skinks in Madagascar. So that's how we have really good biological proof that, that that actually happened. And India actually drifted across the Indian Ocean. Uh, back then it was known as the Tethys Sea and crashed into uh, what is now uh, Central Asia and threw up these huge mountains, uh, the biggest mountains in the world. And the Himalayas are a relatively young mountain range. So most of the mountains that are uh, that, that we see today were formed about 10 to 15 million years ago. So from a geological point of view, the Himalayas are very, very young. And they are such a big uh, force of nature, uh, if you may, that they, they block all the, all the rainfall that comes through uh, India. So it, here in this picture, this is a picture, a, sa a satellite photo of the Himalayas of the earth. And this white line is all these huge 7,000, 8,000 meter peaks that make up the Himalayas. And on, on the north end of, uh, on the north side of the Himalayas is this big rain shadow zone called the Tibetan Plateau, which gets very, very little rainfall because all the rain is, is sort of blocked by the Himalayas and which feeds these huge rivers in uh, North India. The Himalayas are a, uh, as a, are a cold place, but they're also a temperate place. And that's something that many people might not know uh, is that the Himalayas are very, very seasonal. Uh, so they can go from uh, it looking like this uh, in the summer to look the same place looking like that in the winter. Um, and the, the cool thing about the Himalayas is that the trees above about 5,000 feet are very, very similar to trees in your backyard, actually. So if you know trees really well in, in Southern Maryland, you can identify most species uh, of Himalayan trees to genus. Uh, we, have, we, have the, we have maples and birches and cedars and poplars and uh, a bunch of tree species that are very, very closely related to uh, one's uh, Himalayas. Like this one, this is a big old spruce uh, there's supposed to be at least 1300 year old spruce because this temple that's right next to it uh, was, was built in the 1200s. The other cool thing about the Himalayas or any high mountain for that matter is that uh, two things change with elevation very systematically. Uh, the, the first is obviously you can, you can see that in this photo is that the top of the mountain is significantly colder than the bottom of the mountain. And so within a very, very short physical distance, so you may be able to walk from the bottom of this mountain to the top of this mountain in, in, a, in a very, very long day's height. Uh, you can go from subtropical forest in the bottom to alpine tundra at the top of this mountain. And uh, that's basically like going from the tropics to the uh, tropics to the poles uh, vegetation wise. And that's that stratification of habitats brings about uh, really fun ecological questions uh, that, that biologists like me are really interested in. And so the other thing that's, that changes systematically is also, of course, I'm, no, I'm sure you know, is the availability of oxygen. And so oxygen decreases, uh, the, the partial pressure of oxygen decreases as you go up in elevation. And so birds that live at high elevation uh, live in significantly thinner air than birds that live at low elevation. The Himalayas are, despite, uh, the, despite the snow and the hypoxia, the Himalayas are packed with birds. And uh, throughout the Himalayas, there are about 940 species of birds that have been, that have been recorded, which is about, about four fifths of all the birds that are found in India. So the Himalayas are a, absolute treasure trove of, of avifauna. Um, and about, about one in 10 of all the birds found on the planet are, found in the, are also found in the Himalayas. But 
the distribution of that species biodiversity is not uniform. So uh, here is a map that shows the number of species found in any given place. And the darker the red, the more species there are there. And so as you can see, uh, this, is, this is the north of, this is the north-south map. So this is Pakistan and this is like the, uh, this Turkmenistan and Afghanistan up here. This is China right here. The, the northwest part of the Himalayan range is very seasonal, dry, and, and uh, much more sp uh, species poor than this southeastern part of the Himalayas, which is very, very wet, aseasonal, which means that the seasonality is less pronounced and extremely species rich. So this part of the Himalayas actually uh, has almost the same number of species as any, uh, any place in the, like any biodiverse place or even the most biodiverse place in the Andes. So uh, people like Trevor Price like to say that uh, places like the, the Southeast Himalayas are very, very similar in biodiversity, bird biodiversity, to places like the Manu Road of Peru, which is world famous as one of the most biodiverse places. So how do you fit all those 900 birds on a mountain, right? So in, in many ways, the Himalayas are, don't cover a lot of area uh, because they're not that deep. So they're about 200 kilometers or 150 miles deep at any given place. How do you fit all those 900 species in a small area like that? And that's because Himalayan birds show what is called elevational replacement. And that's basically species that are closely related to each other straddle different elevation zones of the same mountain. And so you have closely related birds that live at different elevations. And in a given area, you fit more species on the same mountain because of that third dimension that you get. And a great example of that from, from the US is if you've gone to the Adirondacks National Park up in upstate New York, uh, you have boreal chickadees that live at high elevations and black capped chickadees that live at low elevations. And these, this is a very, very classic elevational species replacement uh, type scenario. If you go to the desert Southwest in Arizona, you have two species of juncos, the yellow-eyed junco and the dark-eyed junco uh, that also sort of replace each other elevationally. The cool thing about the Himalayas is that we take uh, species replacement to, uh, or the Himalayas take a species, the species replacement to an extreme. So you can have up to five species of sunbirds. So sunbirds are birds that are very, very similar in ecology to hummingbirds, but are not, they are not found. Uh, we don't, the, the old world, Africa, Asia, and Australia doesn't have hummingbirds. We, we have sunbirds uh, that fill the same ecological niche. So we can have up to five species of sunbirds that uh, replace each other along the elevation gradient. And we can have up to 12 species of leaf warblers Leaf warblers are very, very similar to the warblers that, that we have here. Uh, they all have that, their own uh, niches and they all feed in different parts of the tree. Uh, but as you go up the mountain, you can go through about 12 species of uh, birds that are resident on that mountain. The last thing that, uh, that, that's really cool about the Himalayas in, is the fact that they are at the junction of two very, very different uh, biogeographic zones. And by, by, by what I mean by that is that a bunch of Himalayan birds are very, very temperate in origin. So as the Himalayas are forming, as, as, India, was, uh, as India was crashing into this Eurasian landmass, a bunch of birds from Siberia and Russia and uh, the Tibetan plateau started getting, coming into the Himalayas. And so uh, some examples of that are nuthatches and bush tits and chickadees. We have several species of all those very temperate northern uh, species, but also we have very, very tropical birds coming in. So we have babblers and flycatchers and these uh, beautiful white eye like birds called euhinas uh, that sort of invaded uh, the Himalayas from the, from the very, very tropical southeast. And both those birds now live at the same elevation and they live together and they've adapted to the same harsh conditions. And this provides a really interesting uh, sort of system 
as a, a natural ex experiment to understand how birds that are very, very distantly related to each other, how do they come to the same environment and adapt to the same uh, environmental challenges? So today I'm gonna to talk to you about two things, uh, two projects. Uh, one is a field project and one is a museum-based project. One that asks how birds uh, cope with what is called hypoxia or the lower, lower pressure of oxygen. And the other is how birds in the Himalayas uh, cope with the cold. So this, uh, this project is something I did during my PhD and it was a lot of fun. And uh, the, the place I did it is a place called the Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. Nanda, uh, Nanda Devi is the name of a peak. Uh, it's the, one of the highest peaks in the Himalayas. And uh, I think it is the ninth highest peak in the world uh, and one of the highest mountains in the country. Uh, this is the this is the view from the my highest uh, mist netting site in the Himalayas. Uh, you can see the the peak uh, this peak called Chokhamba, which is which is also known as the Four Pillars. It's a seven thousand meter peak, which means that there is no peak higher than this than this peak in North America, South America, Australia, Africa, anywhere else in the world, but in the Himalayas. So. Uh, you get to see, you get, you get really uh, spoiled with seeing some of the highest mountains in the world and these amazing uh, mountain panoramas all around you when you work in this place. So my field site for this project is, uh, was in the Northwestern Himalayas in a state called Uttarakhand, uh, which, is, which borders China. Uh, but before I tell you, more about my research, I wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about the birds of Kedarnath. So Kedarnath is the, the smaller region within the Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve where I work. And uh, let me show you some fun bird pictures from, from uh, my study site. My, my study site is most famous for this bird, uh, the Himalayan Monal. It's a pheasant and uh, it's actually, if you, if, if you go to the right elevations, uh, in my field site, there are trash birds. I mean, you would see probably 15 or 20 adult males every day. This is the, this is the male. The female is not uh, as colorful. It's, she's, she's much more cryptic in color. Uh, and it, but every time seeing either the male or the female of this, of this species are, is, is really, really fun. Some other amazing birds in my uh, study site include wall creepers. Wall creepers are a really interesting bird because they are the only bird, uh, they're the only bird in their genus and family, what is called a monotypic family. So wall creepers are found in my, my study site uh, as are uh, scarlet finches, these fire-tailed sunbirds, these amazingly beautiful red sunbirds. We have some fun barbets. Uh, barbets in the Himalayas are very, very closely related to the barbets in South America and fill the same, fill the same role. They are frugivorous birds. So this is a blue-throated barbet. Uh, we have fork tails, which are uh, like dippers, uh, but only more colorful or uh, more flamboyant. Uh, we have fun vultures like this bearded vulture. These vultures also are also called lammergeiers and they have this amazing, they are bone specialists. So they, they, specialize on eating large bones and they eat those bones by picking up the bone flying around and dropping the bones on rocks and then smashing the bones coming down eating the marrow first and then eating the pieces of bones so these these lammer guys right here are really cool vultures we also have a, a suite of uh, bush tit species like this black throated bush tit uh, bush robins which are uh, old old fly catchers uh, some other cool pheasants like this really low elevation college pheasant with its pretty white crest. Uh, some bullfinches, uh, very similar. Again, another very temperate animal uh, that has come, uh, come down from, from Eurasia or Northern Europe into the Himalayas. Uh, and a owl that's very, very similar to the pygmy owl that we have here. This is called a collared owlet. And this is, of course, the back of the head. Uh, just like the pygmy owl in the U.S., the collared owlet in the uh, in the Himalayas and Southeast Asia also have these fake eyes at the at the back of the head. Uh, maybe 
mostly as as a as a defense for from being pecked at. So with that introduction, let me quickly tell you, or let me tell you about how birds cope with the low partial pressure of oxygen. Um, and hypo, hyperbaric hypoxia, which is the which is the scientific way of saying uh, low availability of oxygen, is uh, is is a really interesting sort of factor for a biologist like me because it's a constant feature around the world, right? So it is not affected by latitude or temperature. Um, 10,000 feet at uh, in Antarctica has the same uh, or same same paucity of oxygen as 10,000 feet in uh, in Colorado as 10,000 feet in the Himalayas. So no matter where you are on Earth, if you are at high elevations, there's less oxygen in the air than at low elevations. And because hypoxia is such a widespread environmental challenge for animals, uh, species around the world have adapted in very, very different ways. So the way a llama uh, responds to hypoxia is very different from a deer mouse uh, in North America, is very different from these bothered geese and yaks in the Himalayas. So there's a tremendous diversity of strategies uh, for coping with the low partial pressure of oxygen in the world. And this doesn't stop at, uh, at uh, in, in wild animals, but is also found in humans. So there are three distinct populations of high elevation humans or the high elevations of the world have been colonized by humans independently uh, three times. First in, uh, in Africa, uh, in the, uh, on the Abyssinian plateau, then in Tibet, and then most recently in the Andes. And these three populations of humans also show very, very different uh, strategies and how they cope with hypoxia. But to understand how birds in the Himalayas cope with hypoxia, let's take a quick historical detour. Uh, this is the peak, uh, it's called, this is the peak of Sagarmatha or Mount Everest. Uh, it's, it's a rather high peak in the Himalayas. And it was first uh, climbed by these two gentlemen Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. Edmund Hillary uh, was, in, was a Kiwi. Uh, he was born in Auckland and was a beekeeper. So in the austral summer, which is our winter, he would keep bees and, uh, and live in the coastal town of Auckland in New Zealand. And in this austral winter, which is the, which is the boreal summer, he would come to India and uh, climb mountains in India and Nepal. So most of the year, he lived at sea level in an oxygen rich environment. And uh, for about three to four months of the year, he lived in an oxygen poor environment in the mountains. Very, very different from that was the upbringing of Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, who was, who was a Sherpa, which is a community that lives on the China-Nepal border uh, in the Khumbu region of Nepal. And Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, uh, grew up in a village that, were, that was at 10,000 feet. So uh, Sherpa Tenzing lived as a highlander all his life. He lived in, a, in an environment that was oxygen poor all his life. Just like Sherpa Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary, there are two kinds of birds in the Himalayas. Ones that we, we will call Hillary Robins, uh, live, at high, live at low, low elevations and oxygen rich environments for most of the year, for about eight months of the year, and then migrate elevationally to breed at the top of the mountain in the summer. So eight months in oxygen rich environments, four months in oxygen poor environments. Just like Tenzing, uh, just like uh, Sherpa Tenzing Norge, there are also Tenzing bush tits or high elevation residents that live at the same elevation, same oxygen poor elevation all year round, okay? so. There are these high elevation migrants and high elevation residents uh, that differ in how much oxygen uh, they have at any given time of the year. So let me give you an example of how, uh, how important this is. So this is, uh, these are, this is a graph showing bird species richness on the Y axis here. And on the X axis is the communities that were sampled by me and my field assistants at, dif uh, at different elevations. So I want you to look at the difference uh, between the red and the blue bars at the same elevation. So at 3000 meters, which is about 10,000 feet, 
in the winter, there are only about 30 species of birds uh, that continue to live at that high elevation throughout the winter. But in the summer, the same patch of forest where there were 30 species in the winter can have up to 100 species. And so all these species are your uh, Hillary robins that are elevationally migrating between low elevations and high elevations. And so the, the number of species that elevationally migrate to high elevations is actually quite high. So just to drive my point uh, further, whenever I say Hillary Robin or elevation migrant, I'm actually going to be talking about in, this, in, in the context of this project, talking about nine species of birds that migrate elevationally to different extents between low elevations and high elevations. And whenever I say Tenzing bush tits, I, I'm talking about about six species of birds from various different families uh, that live at the same elevation all year round. And uh, the thing that I studied was uh, what you guys would do to uh, measure how good your blood is at uh, transporting oxygen, which is uh, the hemoglobin concentration of the blood. And I measured this uh, as the, as both the amount of hemoglobin, con uh, hemoglobin in your blood, but also the number of RBCs or red blood cells in your blood. So there are two kinds of ways in which uh, animals respond to low elevations. One is, uh, let's call it the low lander response or the response that you and I would show uh, when we go to high elevations. So if any of you guys have gone to high elevations and walked around, uh, you will know that after after spending about two weeks in uh, at high elevation, if you if you check your blood, you have probably increased the number of red blood cells in your blood, hence increasing the amount of uh, hemoglobin in your blood, which then increases your uh, ability to suck oxygen out of the air. And so, this is a very very ancestral response that's seen across. Uh, all warm-blooded animals, so, so birds, mammals, uh, even reptiles show this response. And, uh, and hence, it's a, it's a response that's, that's the go-to response. But the problem with this response is that uh, as you keep increasing the number of red blood cells in your blood, the, the, the viscosity of the blood also increases, right? So after a point of time, it's like pushing a tomato ketchup through your blood vessels uh, rather than blood. And so after a point of time, you cannot increase the number of red blood cells because then it actually decreases the rate at which blood circulates through your body. So having high RBC counts or high red blood cell counts is good if you are going to go to high elevations only for a short duration but not if you're going to the high or, or if you're going to live at high elevations all year round. And so that's why a lot of animals that live at highlands or live at high elevations all their life actually have sea level levels of hemoglobin or ways of increasing hemoglobin through other ways, not by increasing the viscosity of their blood. So we wanted to see if, 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 these, if this life history difference, whether a bird lives at high elevations or a bird lives at low elevations and then migrates to high elevations, brings about change in how they vary their, the amount of hemoglobin and the hematocrit in their blood. So we climbed up and down mountains, set up mist nets and caught birds using mist nets. Here is uh, my friend Sataj taking out a, a gray hooded warbler from a mist net. Uh, they, we then took small blood samples and measured hemoglobins using uh, hum hemoglobin concentration using the same hemoglobin monitor that uh, you and I would use uh, at home or your doctor uses in the um, in the hospital. It's a it's a handheld device. Uh, and then I had a little motorcycle battery that was attached to a centrifuge to measure the amount of red blood cells in your uh, in the bird's blood. Uh, this centrifuge was the bane of my existence because it was extremely loud and, and really terrible uh, way of collecting data, but hey, it was research. And you can tell how much, I, how much I love this centrifuge by the look I have on my face when I'm looking at it. So I had three basic, uh, three basic uh, predictions. One is that 
hemoglobin concentration increases uh, as you go up in elevation. So all species should show hemoglobin concentration increases. Uh, I predicted that resident species should show a very weak correlation between hemoglobin and hematocrit because they're specialized and live at high, uh, in highlands all their time, all their life. And that elevation migrants should show uh, a very, very strong correlation between high hematocrit and high hemoglobin concentration because they are switching back and forth between these uh, oxygen rich and oxygen poor sites. And so that's exactly what we saw. So within a species, individuals that live at the lower most elevation limit uh, show low elevation, so show low hemoglobin concentration, while individuals of the same species that live at the upper limit of their distribution uh, show high hemoglobin concentration. We showed that high elevation resonance show that lack of relationship between hemoglobin and hematocrit because they don't want very viscous blood, while elevation migrants, because they spend very short duration at high elevations, have a very tight correlation between hemoglobin concentration and the number of red blood cells in their blood. So one, of, one obvious question is how, uh, how high elevation resonance increase their hemoglobin concentration without increasing the number of red blood cells. And that's because uh, these birds pack in more hemoglobin per red blood cell than your regular elevation migrant. And so these birds have figured out a way to increase your hemoglobin concentration without increasing the viscosity of blood. So the, the cool part about this project is that it doesn't matter whether you are a temperate or tropical bird, whether you are a, a warbler or a flycatcher, uh, your response to hypoxia is actually driven by your life history and lifestyle. Birds that live at high elevations all year round have a very different way of dealing with hypoxia than birds that switch back and forth between high elevations and low elevations. And this of course has really important implications for climate change because uh, these tensing bush states that live at high elevations all year round uh, can only increase their hemoglobin concentration to, uh, to, to such an extent uh, in their red blood cells while uh, Hillary Robbins as, as climate change pushes them upslope and into more hypoxic environments uh, will be challenged by the amount of how viscous they can make their blood to keep uh, circulating oxygen in their system. So with that, let me quickly also move to the next part of my talk, which is about uh, how birds stay warm. And this, uh, this part of the talk is basically titled, Do Himalayan Birds Wear Down Jackets? And uh, again, uh, let me remind you that Himalayas are really cool because they have a very, very systematic decrease in temperature as you go up the mountain. Uh, so you can have cold alpine tundra at about 13,000 feet in my field site and separable forest at 5,000 feet, and then a bunch of diff uh, different grades of, uh, of ro rhododendron and oak and spruce and birch forest. The, the inspiration for this, uh, for this particular project that I'm currently doing in the Smithsonian uh, came from a, a, uh, an encounter with this incredible bird that I had at about 10, 11,000 feet in the Himalayas on a very, very cold winter morning. So this, is, this bird is called a gold crest. It's the same genus as a golden, uh, golden crown kinglet, actually it's very, very closely related to golden crown kinglets. And uh, I was out doing uh, bird behavioral observations at about 11,000 feet uh, in, in this really, really cold part, cold morning. Uh, I was out with completely covered in down and down in wool. Uh, and I was try trying to look for birds and how they were foraging and, and coping with this cold weather. So it was about, um, it was about minus 10 degrees Celsius, which is about, uh, which is about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when I saw this bird actively foraging in a tall spruce tree. Now, let me tell you why that is really cool. And hopefully that will also make, uh, make you a little more appreciative of the birds that are around you right now. So this bird, just like the golden crown kinglet, uh, weighs about six grams. Uh, six grams is about a teaspoon of sugar. And uh, the, the bird has to maintain an internal temperature of about 120, is that right? 110 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So it has to have an internal temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius uh, or 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And the temperature that day was about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And so across this really, really tiny barrier of about an inch of, of muscle, skin, and feathers, the bird has to maintain a 90 degree Fahrenheit difference all the time throughout the day. Otherwise, the bird goes into hypothermic shock and can, can die. And so these tiny birds are constantly doing an amazing feat of staying warm enough uh, to survive. So as soon as I saw this bird, I wanted to start taking notes. And I, I, uh, I took my hand out uh, from, from, my, from my glove to start writing down. But it was so cold that my hands went numb almost immediately. And I couldn't write. And I weigh about 65,000 grams. And this bird weighs only 6 grams. And uh, this bird was doing significantly better in that cold than I was. And that's when I thought that I should study how birds stay warm in cold weather. And so let's quickly ask the question, why do bird, how do birds stay warm? Of course, they have an outer lining of feathers. Uh, when those feathers uh, are no longer enough to insulate them against the cold, they do exactly what you and I would do. They start generating body heat by shivering. And so uh, I'm sure it's, there, there's been a time in your life when you've been out with a jacket that's not quite warm enough and uh, you sta you're standing in line somewhere and then you start shivering uh, to produce body heat. That's, that's your muscles contracting to produce body heat. So uh, birds also use a, a whole range of behaviors because, because shivering to produce body heat is such an energy ex expensive uh, thing to do that birds have a suite of behaviors like, uh, like cuddling together uh, to, to conserve body heat or just flying down the mountain to a warmer part of the mountain. So it's just migration. Uh, birds also cache food, which uh, gives them the energy to shiver throughout the night. So they, they have a bunch of many different behaviors that we can talk about uh, to keep warm. Today, we're gonna to talk about feathers and let me give you a quick uh, feathers 101. So there are three kinds of feathers that birds, most birds have. Uh, the, there are wing feathers, tail feathers, and most of the bird is covered by what are called contour or body feathers. Uh, the contour feather has these downy barbs. Uh, so there's the rachis at the center and downy barbs that are non-interlocking and they trap little pockets of air underneath that keeps the bird warm. And then there are these pinaceous barbs that are interlocking barbs uh, which are the water repellent, colorful part of the bird's feather. So the proportion of the feather that's made up of these downy barbs uh, is a, supposed to be a rough indicator of where the bird stays or how cold uh, the bird's environment is. And you can see this in this comparison of, uh, of burrowing owl and snowy owl uh, feathers. And so the snowy owl that lives in the Arctic has a much bigger proportion of the feather made up of these downy barbs than the burrowing owl. Uh, this particular individual comes from San Diego, California, where it's really warm. Uh, and it has a very small part of its feather that's made up of downy barbs, which, which trap heat. The other thing birds can do is just make their feathers really long and make them overlap more. Uh, I'm sure if you've seen uh, fed these, these wonderful images of, of owls, you often see owls have really, really long feathers on their chests, uh, a chest and belly, and they, they overlap a lot and, and again, trap heat that way. So I was really interested in how birds that have evolved in very different parts of the world uh, sort of come together and stay, adapt to the same cold weather of the Himalayas. So how birds from the tropics and the temperate areas uh, have evolved to survive Himalayan winters. And so, I, uh, I brought a bunch of specimens into the museum to understand whether uh, Himalayan bird feathers have an increased proportion of down with elevation, whether temperate and tropical birds show differences in thermal insulation, and whether small birds, because they lose heat faster than large birds, have better insulation. And so I did this by photographing individual feathers on specimens. So here, here I am uh, looking at a feather on a, under a microscope, I photograph that feather and then I measure different parts of the feather. And 
I use a bunch of different statistical methods to basically ask whether birds that live at high elevations wear down jackets. And the answer is yes. So as you go from low elevations to high elevations, bird feathers get more downy. And this is irrespective of whether the bird is tropical or temperate. So both of those birds have sort of uh, biologically speaking, convergently evolved the same technique to, uh, to beat the cold, having more downy feathers. And uh, birds also have long feathers. So small birds that lose heat faster than large birds have significantly disproportionately longer feathers uh, than large birds. And so uh, your, for example, your chickadee uh, has much longer feathers than uh, an American robin. So as you go up in body size, the thermoinsulative potential of your feathers goes down. The cool thing is that we saw these patterns across 250 species of birds. And so uh, we, we predict that this, these are universal patterns in all birds that were not known before. And we are now looking at Andean birds to see if Andean birds show very, very similar patterns uh, compared to Himalayan birds that they are very, very distinctly related to. And so the next time you see a bird uh, that is all puffed up, uh, Take, take pity because it's, it's, it's living uh, in a really, really harsh environment and trying to trap uh, little pockets of air uh, to keep warm. So the next step in this, uh, in this project is to then now understand whether birds that have really downy feathers have to use significantly less energy to stay warm. And again, uh, a big part of that is going to be working with specimens at the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. So hopefully I've told you uh, a little bit more about how birds uh, survive uh, hypoxic and cold conditions in the Himalayas and uh, generally everywhere in the world. Um, with that, I would like to thank my, my team, the Feather Lab at, uh, at the Smithsonian and my funders uh, and uh, my universities. And I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, that was fantastic. Oh, so fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me see if there are any questions yet. Um, I don't see anything noted in the chat. Is there, oh, here we are. Molly asked, she said, this was really amazing. Can you talk a little more about the impact of climate change on these birds? Sure, that's a great question, Molly. Thank you so much. Uh, so birds are impacted in two ways in the Himalayas uh, or in, on any mountain range. Uh, birds are being impacted in two ways. First, there's a increase in, uh, in temperature, right? So there's global warming, which is pushing low elevation birds high and high elevation birds higher. Um, but at the same time, we don't know because the amount of oxygen doesn't change whether with temperature, we don't know how quickly birds will be able to adapt to those high elevations that they're being pushed to. So there might be a, a sort of a, a, a block at the top where birds that are being pushed up will come up against this barrier uh, of hypoxia that they can't breach, or that will take many, many years for them to adapt to. Uh, the other thing that's really fascinating and really understudied is the uh, as I'm sure you know, that's happening in the United States, it's happening all around the world, is the, the frequency, intensity, and magnitude of extreme weather events is increasing in the Himalayas as it is uh, in the US. So there are these incredible snowstorms and, uh, and really warm events uh, in, the, in the winter, really cold events in the summer, uh, and, and birds are are really delicate creatures. And so we, we don't really understand how well they are adapted to survive a, a major cold snap in the summer. Uh, so a lot of research needs to be done, uh, but we can, we can tell from other, uh, other research in other parts of the, uh, in the world that it doesn't look very good, that there, there can be some very grave uh, outcomes of these extreme weather events on Himalayan birds.
Okay, Lynn, Lynn has a question for you in the chat. Um, and she asks yeah, I can, a, a technical question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you so, see it? Yeah, that's, a, again, that's a, that's a really great, they're very perceptive, Lynn. Uh, so the boards generally have a little higher hemoglobin concentration uh, than most uh, than most humans. Uh, board hemoglobin concentrations vary between, uh, well, it depends on who you are, but uh, birds very, very uh, commonly have hemoglobin concentrations about 18, 19, which is very, very high for humans. Um, and that's why this hematocrit hemoglobin sort of relationship breaks apart in birds. Um, and so the, the, the answer to your question is that birds that live at high elevations all year round have, have the same hematocrit as a bird that lives at low elevations, which is about 50, 50%, um, or 50% of the, of the, which means 50% of the blood's volume is made up of red blood cells. Um, and birds that live at low elevations, but winter at high elevations, when they get really high hemoglobin, they increase that hemoglobin, hematocrit count. So that goes up to 60, 65. So uh, you're right in saying that it is about 3x, uh, but it may not be exactly 3x, or it may not be as uh, close to how humans vary their hemoglobin uh, in, in birds. I hope that answers your question. Great. She said yes, <laughs> excellent. Uh, Another person says, uh, Cindy says she will never look at um, bird feathers in her yard the same way. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. I, I, I hope you don't. Bird feathers are incredible. Uh, oh, th thanks, Lynn. It looks, sounds, like, sounds like you've worked in a biomedical lab at least, if not, uh, if not outdoors. Yeah, the feathers are incredible also because they, uh, they also, now, now there's incredible, there's some really cool new research, again, with museum specimens uh, that show that birds not only, feathers not only insulate heat, so they trap heat inside, but they also absorb heat. So depending on what color the bird is, uh, feathers can actually absorb heat. So darker colors absorb heat faster uh, than lighter colors. And uh, iridescent birds, so, so hummingbirds, for example, birds with iridescent feathers uh, absorb heat really quickly. So if, if, a, if a hummingbird uh, exposes its iridescent feathers to a bright summer sun, uh, they can heat up really, really quickly. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not only a down jacket, it's a heat absorbing down jacket. So it's really, imagine having a down jacket that, where you go out and it sort of matches the, the, the temperature outside to then start absorbing heat in addition to just insulating you from the cold. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> um, do you find differences in the colors of the birds then when, when they go to cooler places? Uh, that's a great question. And, and we, we sort of don't know because the, the color of the plumage is, uh, is, is sort of driven by a number of different things, right? So a, a horned lark, for example, uses its plumage to blend in with its habitat mm -hmm. uh, just as much as it probably uses it to stay warm. And so it, it's, it's these uh, trade-offs that these birds have uh, that probably drive. So for example, I mean, this is only a hypothesis that has, has, I have not tested, but what I think horned larks do is they have this very light plumage on top. So the pinaceous barbs are really light in color because that, that camouflages them uh, against their surroundings, but they have this really dark color down underneath that probably absorbs sunlight as it, as it, uh, as it falls on their backs. So they have uh, a, this, they, they use their feathers really creatively to stay, to stay warm. Good. Molly's asked another one. Uh, well, Molly, that's a that's a really interesting question, and it's it's a hard one uh, because we 
there are there's good things and bad things about uh, about increased ecotourism. Well, there's there's something obviously bad about leaving thousands and thousands of oxygen tanks on Mount Everest. So that's clearly bad. Uh, so there's a lot of trash on on very very popular tourist destinations in the Himalayas. But in general, ecotourism is actually giving us a lot more data on on Himalayan birds. And uh, I'm actually working on a paper where we are uh, studying Himalayan bird distribution using eBird data. And so now that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people going to the Himalayas and watching birds, we finally have information on what species is distributed where, how uh, species change their distribution based on seasons. And we are actually through human activity uh, and hopefully with with birds with with e birders, uh, it's very low impact uh, activity in the Himalayas. Uh, we are actually gaining information that we didn't have before, and so uh, it's really difficult to tell whether humans are having an impact on bird populations because we don't know what bird populations were before. So it's we can we can be pretty confident uh, to say that when we cut down forests, which is happening at a really fast pace, especially in the low lower elevation, so at to about 5,000, 6,000 feet, uh, that a lot of forest birds are losing out on habitat. But uh, we are finally actually building a, a basic database of where birds are and uh, how many there are and how, how they move along elevation gradients. That is fascinating about eBird use. Um, I see that on everywhere, actually, on social media, they, all mm -hmm. around the world, in South America, and everywhere, people are using eBird. It's yeah. wonderful. It's really cool. Are there any other questions for Sahas? Um, I I just loved your bird pictures. I have to tell you, they. I oh, I want to go bird watching in India now. <laughs> yeah, India is a India is a fabulous place. I mean, it has. Yeah, I think now there are about thirteen hundred species that are seen in India. Eleven hundred seen almost every year. So it's a you can see wow. you can see a lot of birds in India. Yeah. Wow! Wow! <laughs> yes, I'm I. I just feel so terrible that you know COVID has really curtailed all of my international travel and yeah. pretty much even all of my stateside travel too. Right. I hope things are going to improve. Yeah, um, I hope I hope things I hope things change. Also, I I'm dying to go back and start working, uh, doing field work in the Himalayas myself. Yes, I bet I bet is uh, I imagine you're anxious to go home anyway. For visits, <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been back home uh, since I've been vaccinated, but uh, not really to my field site, which is sort of a second home to me now because I lived oh. there for four years. Oh, that's cool! Very cool. Uh, you're getting rave reviews here in the chat. Everybody Thank loved you so your much talk. For... We're incredibly thankful to you. Um, would you mind holding on after people start to um, cycle off, so I can um, talk with you? about one thing I forgot sure. to ask. Okay, Absolutely. great. All right, I'll turn off the recording now and um, bid everyone farewell. Thank you everybody for joining us. Take care and happy holidays to everybody.